My name is Faye Clemens, and I'm from Lakeland in Michigan. Well, I went to a, the VA clinic one time, and they told me that my potassium and uh, phosphorus was pretty high, and they said if I didn't control my diet closer, that I didn't end up on dialysis. Well, that was way back a long time ago, so I listened to what they told me, and I got away with it for quite a few years. And finally, it did catch up to me. So I went to a doctor one day and he said, you're going to have to go on dialysis, which I thought was going to be the end of the world. But after a while, I accepted that this is the way it's going to be. And it worked out just fine. So uh, I think most of it, from what I found out up to this point, if I listen to what the people here tell me, it really works out a lot better. Found out it's better not to fight the situation to go along with it. Hi, I'm David Waltman. I'm an osteopathic physician and I'm also a nephrologist or what's commonly known as a kidney doctor. Okay. Common question we get is what is dialysis and what's it indicated for? Dialysis is a way to substitute for the kidney to do the actions of the kidney to clean the toxins out of the body and get rid of the excess fluid that we produce. And when someone's kidneys aren't working correctly, it's the only organ that we're able to replace with a machine basically to do that job for us. Why is dialysis needed? The main reason is when the kidneys stop doing their own job in terms of cleaning the poisons and getting rid of the fluid, and there's a lot of different reasons that that can occur, that's when we get someone set up for chronic dialysis. And when we do dialysis, there's a couple of different ways that we can do it. The most common way is where someone comes to our dialysis center three times a week, and each session is typically around three and a half to four hours or so. And during that time, the patient sits in the chair, while we do the dialysis procedure to clean the blood and get rid of the excess fluid. And then once we're done, then the patient goes home. Uh, when we talk about dialysis access, what, what that means is how are we gonna get access to your blood? Because we need to get blood from your body to the machine and back to your body. If we have time to prepare ahead of time, if someone is following with a kidney doctor and we have months of uh, preparation or planning ahead of time, what we typically like to do is put in what's called a fistula. And a fistula is commonly made in the arm and a surgeon takes the blood vessels and we typically have two arteries going down the arm and we have several veins coming up and the surgeon is able to take one of the arteries, remove it, sew it to a vein so the blood just comes up like this. And over time this matures and it's called a fistula completely made with your own tissue. And with that, if it works well, it should last for a patient's lifetime. If someone's blood vessels are too small, they're scarring or other reasons this doesn't work, the same surgery can be performed, but this time we use a plastic tube and that's called a graft. And that graft is sewn in and we use that graft for our access for our dialysis. When we use a typical fistula, those can take around three months or so to heal before we can use them. That's why it's important to follow along with a kidney doctor ahead of time. When we put a graft in or the plastic material, that takes generally about a month or so uh, in order to heal and use. Now, if somebody presents an ED dialysis right away and they don't have a month to three months to heal, we have to put a plastic catheter in the chest. And it's called a tunnel catheter. It usually goes a little ways below. Here's my collarbone here. It goes about an inch or so below the collarbone and it's tunneled under the skin into the jugular vein. Then it goes into the body. And there's two catheters that stick out like my fingers would. And what we do is we hook one up to a machine and it goes to the machine to clean the blood, remove the fluid, and then the tube comes back here to deliver the blood back to the body. And that's what we call temporary access. And this is kind of a bridge to perform dialysis till we can get something going in the arm. The other form of dialysis that we can uh, perform for patients, and it's something that we hope to do in the spring of 2016 here at Portage, is a type of dialysis that can be done at home, and it's called peritoneal dialysis. This doesn't require a machine, it doesn't require coming to a dialysis unit three times a week, and when we do this procedure, a uh, surgeon does this ahead of time, and it takes generally about a month to get things all set up and running. But if the belly's okay and there's not a lot of scar tissue and we're able to do this surgically, we have a catheter that's placed from the outside and it tunnels under the belly and it goes in into the abdominal cavity. It doesn't go into the intestines, not in the stomach, but it goes around it. And the way that this works is we use the lining of the abdomen to basically function like the kidney. So we have a catheter tip coming out and with that catheter tip, we'll hook a big bag of what's called dialysis fluid. It might be 64 ounces will flow that 64 ounces in the belly, let it dwell for around six hours or so, then we'll drain it. And during that time of the six hours where it's in the belly, 
it clears the toxins and it helps to remove fluid. So if we put in 64 ounces and we drain it in six hours, I might drain 80 ounces, 85 ounces. And that way I'm getting rid of fluid as well as toxins. And that's typically done around four times per day, every day of the week. The nice thing with that is someone can travel, they don't have to be tied to a schedule, and if someone's able to do it, that's a nice way to do dialysis. We also have, and we hopefully at some point have it here at Portage, is what is called a cycler. And with that, it's a machine that sits at your bedside. It's the size of a small microwave oven. It's not very large. And a patient hooks the catheter up to this machine at nighttime when they go to bed. And at nighttime, while someone is sleeping, fluid is put into the belly. It's drained, put in, drained, and it does the lion's share of the work while someone is sleeping. And that's a nice modality to go. It's good for people that live far away from the city, uh, and someone who has difficulties with trans or transportation. Uh, and the only real um, caveats that we have to have in order to do home PD or peritoneal dialysis is we have to have someone with good hand dexterity because you're doing sterile connections. I have to have good vision. If the vision is poor, I can't do that very uh, sterilely and also have to have someone who's knowledgeable and it's you don't have to be a rocket scientist to do it quite often we'll have friends family spouses children help out but uh, that's another way that we can do dialysis as well no doesn't hurt once you get used to the needles it's not bad at all and uh, they put them in so gently around here you don't even notice it yeah. if you listen to what you're told it's a lot easier believe me just listen to what you're told because even when I got here, the dietician told me, she said, just listen to what I'm telling you and you'll be all right. And so far, she hasn't said too much to me, so I must be doing something <laughs> right. When someone uh, comes to dialysis, we do what's called a pre-hemo evaluation. This is done every time when someone comes to a dialysis treatment. When they come in, the nurse checks them out. How are you doing? Make sure everything's okay. Anything new going on? And then the patient is weighed, so we know how much they weigh. We've already established at that point what we consider good, what's called a dry weight. What do we want you to weigh at after your treatment? So after the weight is done and a few questions are done, the patient sits in their chair. They have their heart and their lungs listened to. They're given a little examination to make sure they're okay. And then the nurse hooks them up to the dialysis machine, either from the plastic catheter that's in place where they use tubing, or if they have a fistula graft in the arm where they put needles in. And then that's when we start our dialysis procedure. When uh, we do do the dialysis session, a lot of people are wondering, how do we do this? And what happens is it's, from a patient's point of view, it's rather straightforward. You just sit down in a chair. We've got reclinable chairs, seats come up. You can lay back, you can take a nap. Uh, it's probably out of our view, but we do have televisions for everybody. You can put in earbuds and listen to your favorite or watch your TV shows. Uh, some people read, some people sleep, but basically this is where you're gonna be spending uh, the dialysis treatment. This is what's called a dialysis machine. It's off right now, but this is what does the bulk of our work in terms of cleaning the, the body. And what is done is whether somebody has a fistula in their arm or graft in their arm or a plastic catheter up top, we have the, our two IV lines. And I'll just kind of demonstrate. We take the one, the red means artery, kind of like this is blood coming from the heart. And it goes from the patient and it goes through our tubing system and then it runs through this thing what's called a filter. And this filter is actually what cleans the blood and this also removes the fluid. So after the blood comes up, comes through here, goes through our filter, the blood is now clean, the fluid is removed, then it goes out through this blue IV and this blue IV is what comes back to our patient and goes back into their body. So this is kind of like leaves the body, gets clean and goes right back. And during this dialysis procedure, this is where our nurses and our technicians hook everything up in terms of how much fluid do we remove, how long does somebody dialyze, any complications. There's always alarms. This turns red when there's a problem. Patients are constantly asked, how are you doing, making sure things are okay. And this is the way the system works during the dialysis treatment. And when it's completed, the reverse is done. And the machine is turned off as the blood is returned to the patient. Once the patient's blood is returned, this pretty much goes on standby. We unhook the, the needles or the catheters, make sure our patients are good, and once they seem to be doing okay, making sure that they're safe, then they're allowed to go home. Uh, when we do do dialysis, everything we hope goes real smooth. We hope to remove fluid, remove toxins, that you feel well and then you're able to go home. Uh, some of the complications that can occur with dialysis that are really rather common is low blood pressure, and cramping in the legs. Those are probably our most common ones that, that we see. Because if you if you think about it, if my blood pressure is okay and for some reason my arm is cut off, I'm gonna lose a lot of fluid. When I lose fluid and blood, my blood pressure is gonna drop and I'm gonna feel horrible. 
if we're pulling fluid off, as we're pulling the fluid off, the blood pressure may drop and someone may feel poorly with that. And when we're pulling fluid, we may get to the point where someone's having cramps. The key to staying healthy on dialysis is keep fluids as low as possible because the more fluid in the body, the more the heart has to stretch and it can wear the heart out over time. So we try our best to keep fluid as low as we can. Unfortunately, there's no blood test, there's no x-ray, there's nothing we can do to see what is the perfect weight for somebody. So we typically keep pulling fluid off at a slow pace until either someone's blood pressure drops or they have some cramps in the legs. That's Once somebody has that, we usually add about a pound or two to that weight, then that's how we consider what someone's dry weight is. So that's probably the hardest thing with dialysis is, as a complication is uh, low blood pressure and feeling poorly. Uh, some people can get nauseated uh, when they're at dialysis. It's not too common. Uh, we realize by the time someone gets to dialysis, they've probably been on a lot of medications for a long time. So we try and provide some medications at dialysis to help ease the burden at home, as well as give medicines that are essential for staying healthy that aren't available uh, in pill form. Uh, one product that's given generally every week is a shot of a medication to help your bone marrow produce red blood cells to prevent someone from becoming anemic. The kidneys actually make a hormone that goes to your bone marrow to tell your bone marrow to make blood cells. This is how we prevent anemia. But with kidney disease, that hormone's not made, so all patients end up with anemia, or nearly everybody. So this is something that we can give in a shot form so we can replace what the kidney was doing in order to help uh, your bone marrow work out to uh, produce red blood cells. The other medication that we typically give at dialysis is something to help control some glands in the neck called the parathyroids. These can become overactive when someone has chronic kidney disease or is on dialysis. And if these are not controlled very well, they can cause problems with the bone down the road or the bones down the road. So this is something we give a medication for. Uh, we can do it in pill form. Sometimes we use IV. Sometimes we use stuff at home or medications at home that can do this. And um, otherwise, uh, medications that are given at dialysis are fluid. If someone is dehydrated and their blood pressure is low, if the blood pressure is quite high, we have medicine on board that we can give to help reduce the blood pressure. If someone's nauseated, we have medicines for that. And we try and take care of all the little things that come along, you know, that we expect to happen. After uh, someone is done with their dialysis, we have what's called the post-dialysis care. And what that is, is it's kind of a quick assessment. At the end of dialysis, your blood pressure is checked, your heart is checked to make sure everything is okay. And to make sure that you're okay and you're going to do okay when you go home, everyone stands up for a little bit of time. Because when you stand up, fluid's going to go in your lower extremities or your legs, and your blood pressure may fall. And the last thing in the world we want is someone falling on the way out to their car or at their home. So we check their blood pressure and their heart rate when they're standing, and if it's okay, you're good to go. If it's not okay, you stay here. Sometimes it's just a few minutes of time that need to pass before you're good to go, and sometimes we have to give some IV fluids back. Either way, we wanna make sure someone is safe when they go home. After the dialysis is completed, the patient gets weighed on a scale, so we know exactly how we did with that, and we just make sure they're feeling okay, then they're free to go home. The hardest part it's getting up and coming here. <laughs> but, but once you're here, it, it's all right. It, they take care of you. But I'll tell you, by the end of the shift, you're willing to go home. Oh, yes, I've been to Hawaii. So and, uh, they scheduled everything right from here, scheduled everything in Hawaii for me, which was wonderful. Over there, the people just accepted you because all the paperwork was done right and everything. It was just amazing that there was no hitches. When someone starts dialysis, it's a life-changing endeavor. And there's a lot of things change, and we realize that. And it's not all comes from one person. I look at a dialysis crew kind of like a good baseball team. Everyone has to do their job good in order to have a successful ball club. And so what we have at the dialysis center, it starts with our nurses. We have very good nurses that will keep a good eye on our patients. They'll give the medications, they'll do the assessments up front. But behind the nurses, we have our dialysis technicians. These folks are vital to what we're doing as well too. They help provide dialysis care in terms of placing our needles, setting our patients up for dialysis, do the minute by minute um, uh, chores that patients uh, need done while they're on dialysis, also to check to make sure they're doing okay. So on the surface, our nurses and our tech are what our patients see. Uh, behind the scenes, there's a lot of folks that help out. We have our uh, uh, social worker uh, or social workers, depending on where you're at. And the social workers help to make sure you're all set up for your transportation. Can you pay for your medications? If not, how can we get them at a reduced cost for you? How's your living 
arrangements. Uh, if you're able to get a successful transplant, where can we get that done at? If you want to travel, how can we set that up for you? So our social worker helps out a lot more of the behind the scenes with that. Also, the uh, help is also uh, given to us by our dietitian because when someone is on dialysis, there are certain fluids that need to be limited, certain foods that need to be avoided, and other foods that need to be pushed in order to provide good nutrition. So we have what's called a renal dietitian uh, see our patients, and they're seen every month. They look over their laboratory testing, and they get coaching and education in terms of what's going on to make sure our patients stay healthy while they're on dialysis. Because it's hard on the body to be on dialysis. If you're malnourished, it's even worse. So we uh, help out with having a dietitian available for that. We also have uh, available for us our secretarial staff, just like in any office, if you will, to help provide facts for prescriptions, to help schedule different dialysis treatments, and make sure everything runs smoothly. And then behind the scenes, that's kind of where the doctor comes in. I'm kind of like, um, you'd say the manager of the ball club. You know, you can be the doctor, but you have to have an excellent team of everybody. So I have like the background or any kidney specialist to help out with writing the prescription to get the dialysis done, talk to our social workers to make sure everything is set up, chat with our dietitians to make sure we got good meal planning set up, chat with our nurses, how are the patients doing, chat with our technicians to make sure everything's running smoothly with dialysis and kind of coordinate everything. And then once we have our whole team put together, then we provide very good care. So it's not just the nurse or the tech or the doctor, it's everyone has to provide good care. And that's something we really pride ourselves on doing here is that we've got a good team and you need that team approach to provide good care and we do what are called uh, patient care conferences periodically where all of us gang up on the patient at once and so the patient's usually dialyzing and you get a bunch of chairs around and we talk about what's going on in terms of how are you feeling, how's your nutrition, how's your living situation, are you a candidate for transplantation, any questions and everything is well orchestrated so the patients get a good education their family's certainly welcome to be around when we do those. So that's kind of like what we look at in terms of our, our team concept. One question commonly asked of the kidney doctor is once someone starts dialysis is can I get a kidney transplant? In the long haul a patient's best way to survive as long as they can is with a transplant. Uh, in terms of feeling better, not having to come to dialysis, not having to do dialysis at home if someone is doing peritoneal. But a transplant leads somebody to a new life. They're not, you know, having to come to dialysis is our goal. We love for everyone to be able to get listed for a transplant, but the reality is if someone is older, old is kind of defined in terms of how you're doing. You know, there are people that are 50 years old that have had a rough life and they look old. And I have some patients that are 70, 75 years old that are 75 years old, but they look like they're 50. So we try not to use age as a criteria in terms of whether someone can get a kidney or not. We like to uh, allow all of our patients to get the option of getting looked at for a kidney transplant. Here in Portage, what we typically do is use the University of Wisconsin because of the proximity. It's rather close. If not here, I have uh, ties at the uh, Henry Ford down in Detroit. I work with their kidney doctors. I also train at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, and that's a fine transplant center as well. And where someone goes is up to themselves. You know, we have no alliance to any particular unit, and the goal is to get the kidney transplant, and when that's done, have the rest of their care done here locally so they don't have to travel very much. Uh, the process in which someone gets a kidney transplant is if they request it, and it looks on the surface that they're a good candidate, we have them go to a transplant center to get looked at. And then a transplant center will look at uh, several things. One, medically are they fit to get a kidney transplant? Two, are they surgically able to get the transplant done? Third, do they have a good social network in terms of family and friends to be able to help out if they need any uh, assistance at their home? And transportation, can they make it to their appointment? And kind of put the whole package together, kind of like our dialysis team, they have a transplant team, and those are the folks that make the decision whether someone gets a kidney or not. And if someone does get a kidney, the nice thing that's come about in the last probably 10 years or so is kidney swapping. Some centers call it paired kidney donor exchange programs, which is a big fancy word for swapping, which would be if, uh, if I had someone next to me and they needed a kidney and I wanted to give them my kidney, but I'm the wrong blood type, you can't do it. But if there's another group or another two people has the same situation, my kidney might be able to go to that person and that person's loved one's kidney would go to my family or friend. So basically swapping out a kidney. With that, you don't need to have a living relative. 
You just need a healthy donor. So it can be a friend, an acquaintance, someone who's willing to donate. By doing that, it's really shortened the time waiting for a kidney. And in the state of Michigan, the waiting period for kidneys is upwards of around six years. So when we don't have a potential living donor, we have to be prepared. We have to keep you as healthy as we can till your number comes up. And that's where having a potential living donor is the best benefit. It's definitely worth it. You feel a lot better once you get caught up, they catch up the, the poisons in your system. The thing is, you got to have a positive attitude. If you can get a positive attitude, it makes everything so much easier because these people here that work here will do everything to help you out. Just ask them and they'll bend over backwards for you.